Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Christ Chapel. We are glad you're with us. If you're online, thank you for joining us as well. I'm Reverend Joel Walls. I am the pastor here, and we just pray for God's blessings to be upon you as we have our service today. And in our service, it'll be about an hour and 15 minutes. We'll have some music, I'll have a message, and then we'll have a time of prayer request. So if you're online, if you could put those in the comment section uh, between now and the end of the message, when you see this sign again that's on your screen, the, is today the day, you'll know it's coming from wrapping up the sermon, so you can send in your request by that time, then we will get those sent to me, and we'll pray for those. If we happen to miss them, we will include them in the prayer list this week. If you're here, we'll ask for those requests at that time. So let's go to God in prayer as we begin our service. God, we thank you for a day that we can gather before you, and we ask that your Holy Spirit's presence will be with us, that you will fill this place with your presence, your power, your glory. And God, we just ask that as we put aside our hectic week and take time just to be with you, O oh God, that you will minister to our hearts and to our spirits and our souls. We thank you, O oh God, for all that you're doing in our life and in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. So at this time, if you'll stand with us as the music team comes forward and leads us out in song. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all.
you never lost a battle And I know, I know thank the team again for these um, songs that they present to us to help us just to, to get ourselves together and ready to worship God. We thank God. Thank you for that. I have titled the message, Is Today Today? And that can be used in many different ways. It can be seen as positive affirm affirmation, that it could be the day that something good is going to happen. It could be the day that maybe something not so good could happen. We know that that title can be everything. But um, what about when we look about the promises in Scripture about Christ's return. 
That could be good or bad for us, depending on where we stand on things, uh, depending on where we are in our life. And I remember talking about the end times when I was a kid, and, and we would be so afraid that Jesus would come back before we had experienced all the things we wanted to experience. And, of course, those who had experienced some of those things let us know what we're missing out on. So it's those things that you're thinking, Jesus, come back, but not right now. Wait a little longer. And we kept worrying about it. And, and we know that the return of Christ has been on the minds of Christians since Jesus left the first time. We also start wondering, well, is today the day? I don't know about you, but I look at this world sometimes and I think, wow, we seem to be getting closer to it every day. When I read the paper in the morning, I, it can scare me at times. Uh, sometimes it gets my dander worked up. Other times I find that it's, that I want to know more about a story. There's other times it just petrifies me. But once in a great while, you'll see those good news as well. I also know that whenever we look at social media, we start thinking, this world really is going down the tubes. And we really start worrying about it. And we just because we know that it's just out there more readily available to us, all this information. And one of the things I subscribe to is Christian leaders. And it used to be a great resource when you're working with churches. It would give you like four things how to do this or ten lists of how to do that. Different things to help you in ministry. And over the years, it's kind of changed to where now it's just a Christian tabloid. But I still will, listen, will read it to kind of catch up on some of the things that's going on. But I notice that even with them, they do things to instigate you to get your dander up because if they can, they'll get more clicks, and more clicks means more money. It's kind of sad that we're at that point that Christian leaders, that that's actually a good characteristic, apparently. But they made a blanket statement this last week about that these clergy are speaking up against whatever topic of the day it was. I tell you, but it's no need for us to go into that right here. But, it, but then as I looked at the article, there were like maybe five or six clergy that they had addressed. And it was all the ones who were opposed to this thing, none about those who were for it. And I'm thinking, well, that doesn't seem very balanced. And of course, we know that with clergy, there are a dime a dozen. Or $24.95 if you get your license online. But it's just those things that we know that there's all these things that we see coming from all these areas. And even pastors are saying this. And it just makes us really confused. In our world, we're like, what is going on? Jesus, are you returning or are you not? What's happening? And I know we're closer to the return of Christ than we were when the disciples asked Jesus the same question. And we also know scripture is very vague. Scripture doesn't give us a lot of information about it, and I know it's in my lifetime. It's like every few decades we'll start hearing about it yet again. And John and I are watching this uh, comedy that I'll show on, on, that's being streamed, and it's about the end times. And so as I was even thinking, okay, all this stuff going on, even those in the world are saying, we're coming to the end. This is just too insane. But again, going back to the 70s, 80s, that's all we heard about. Christ is coming back. In fact, our music was from a group called Maranatha, which means, Lord, come back. So we know these things are out there. The, the, and of course, in those days, it was always that fear of God that was in our life that you better not be doing anything wrong when Jesus returns or you're doomed to hell. And it just lived in constant fear of that. In fact, I got where I would practice saying, Jesus, forgive me for my sins as fast as I could say it. Because I thought if he's coming in a twinkling of eye, I got to get all that out in that moment because there may be things I don't know I did wrong that I did wrong that I need to ask forgiveness for. Oh, thank God my dad knew about grace. And my dad preached about grace constantly. And that grace gave us such confidence or gave me confidence as a kid to know that what other these people were teaching us at church camp or other parts of our denomination, that my dad just gave me that sense of hope. Despite what's going on around us, if Jesus comes back today or in a thousand years, it isn't that what matters. It's that we follow the things of Christ. So as I looked at this topic for a little bit, I, we know Matthew 24 is one of the main passages that talks about the return of Christ. So I've got a lot of verses here for you, but it's kind of to set the stage of where I want to go with this this morning. So it's in Matthew 24. We're going to start with verse 3. And it says... As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, 
Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. And at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Now then, following that section, Jesus goes into part about the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in 70 AD, thus letting us know this is all just the beginning of knowing that things are going to continue happening along the time until it is time. Jesus makes us aware that should he return, it's not going to be done in secret. That it will be like lightning in the sky. Everyone will see it. Everyone will know. So these groups that say, well, Jesus has already returned, it's like, no, no, no. It would have been known. So we realize that isn't true, but then he gets to verse 20, or 36, and it says, but about the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So again, letting us know, these are just precursors. And we see all of those things, most of those things, constantly happening in our world. They're just birth pains leading up to when Christ will return. Now again, we jump to the book of Acts. Again, I told you I got a lot of verses in the first, and then we'll get to the message part. But just to get, again, getting it laid out, that Jesus, when he died, he rose again. He spent 40 days on earth, and a lot of that time was with the disciples But when he was leaving in Acts 1, we're told, and then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? So they're still questioning. They're wondering, okay, you died, you rose again. Are you now going to do it? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their eyes and and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going and when suddenly two men dressed in white stood before them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now, there's those basics. That is pretty much what lot we have about Christ's return, when it's going to happen. We know we got the book of Revelation. That's a whole other topic. And maybe when we bring back the Bible study in the fall, maybe that's something we will address at that time. But what we know is from this, we don't know when it will happen. In our enlightened age, we read this passage in Acts about Jesus ascending into heaven and that he's going to come back the same way. And we're like, that doesn't make sense to us. How is that even possible? We believe the word of God, but it doesn't match with our scientific logic or how it can go about. Well, we also know that even those who aren't of the Christian faith do believe in a spiritual realm. That there are two different realms, and we know sometimes those intersect. We don't know how it's going to happen, but hasn't God told us that all things are possible with God? So we know that we can see that even though it may not make sense to us, there is a way that God will work it out. But I believe what we do from these passages then is not get caught up of, oh my goodness, we're in the last days, oh my goodness, and be fretful and fearful. But I think we go back to this passage that we started with and we look at it again to think of what are the lessons that we need to put into practice? What are we supposed to be doing as we wait for that day of Christ's return? Yes, the way the world is operating, the way it is happening, we think it could be any time now. The world is overheating. We know that our fire season last year was horrible. When John and I went to Frank and Chuck's wedding last year, going up uh, north, and the sky, it was like the, uh, it was the apocalypse. So we understand some of these things in Scripture about the sun and moon will be darkened. If the planet is burning up, we can see that that could be how it's going to be hidden. 
But then again, I jump back to the 70s when we were told Jesus was coming back and L.A. smog and Phoenix smog was so bad, the same thing was happening, you couldn't quite see the sun. So, you know, there's always going to be something that says it. But what we know is this is just making us say that whether Jesus comes back today or another thousand years, we aren't disappointed if he doesn't come back, but we are just make sure that we are in a relationship with Christ no matter what is happening. So as we look at these things, we're going to look back. The three things I want us to look at, and it's found in three verses, is backing up to Matthew 24, 12 through 14. Because the increase of wickedness, the love of most will go, grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So what is he telling us? What's that first thing he's encouraging us? First, hold on to love. Hold on to love. Because he's predicted that with the increase of, of wickedness, that love will grow cold. And don't we know we need to sense love in the world? Because frankly, right now, in a lot of those who call themselves Christians, we're not sensing a lot of love. Especially if you don't agree with everything that they say and do. So it kind of frustrates us. It's like, God, we're even seeing in your own household those who their love seems to be growing cold, unconcerned for others, just about what's in it for them. When we start our outreach this, last, this year, <clears throat> we start with DragCon, and John came up with the slogan, Preach Love. That is our slogan. That is what we need to be doing as we prepare for the things of whatever Christ does. If he returns, doesn't return, no matter what our mission is to preach this love to our world. And I know that can be an oversimplification of, oh, just love, love, love. In fact, when I was in dealing with uh, coming out and trying to figure out how my orientation and my spirituality was going to merge together, I came across a book called The Unhappy Gaze written by Tim LaHaye, and if you know Tim LaHaye, you know where that's going. But at the end of the book, this last chapter was called The Church of Sodom. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, what is he talking about? Well, come to find out, when I was in college, I would park my car in the parking lot across from this church that I had no idea. They were a downtown church. They were, I figured if you're downtown in this part of the town, you must be struggling to survive. So every day as I'd walk to work just a couple blocks down, I would pray for that church and come to find out that was MCCLA. I had no clue that was who that was. But he was calling them the Church of Sodom. And his angst against them was they went to visit and when they went to visit, all they talked about was love, love, love. And that was his criticism. And I'm thinking, isn't that what we're supposed to teach? <laughs> isn't that what we're supposed to do? So it just helped me with my journey. But we do see that many of things are, their love is growing cold in our world today. As we look at the news, and it's filled with all kinds of things, and even uh, we know with social media, it's probably not that much more wicked in our world. It's just we know it more now. Uh, I don't know if any of you are on the Next Door app, but every day there's something that has happened in someone's house or yard or car, and we start thinking, oh my goodness, it's just getting worse and worse. No, we just know about it now when before it was just the neighbors and the LAPD. So we realize that it's not that different. Politically, yeah, we have gone off the deep end. Some of the nicest people in the world have become the most aggressive, entitled, argumentative. People I like are really difficult to keep on Facebook sometimes. So we start seeing that we understand that we're understanding this thing of needing love. How do we allow love to continue to flow through us? I had a couple examples. I, well, I'll go ahead and share them with you since I got them down here. But there's someone who's trying to say, well, the separation of church and state is a federal law, not a state law. So they're wanting states to now have no separation of church and state. There was a pastor who recently was uh, in trouble because he didn't report as a mandatory reporter whenever a child in his church had been molested. And his response was, unless someone shows me in scripture that I have to do that, I am not a mandatory reporter. Wait, our job is to take care of people, to love people, to be there for them. And it does make us think, well, with the world growing cold, what do we do? Well, let's go back to the basics. Those of us who grew up in church, we can quote John 3.16. The very first, God so loved, he gave. 
Go further back to Moses, and Jesus reiterated it, was what are we to do? Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Then Jesus took it the next step further and said, not just love your neighbor as yourself, love one another as I have loved you, meaning love sacrificially. So when we start seeing this is what he's calling us to, then we understand that it is a difficult task. Because there are people I love, and they do say things that I just drive me nuts. And then I have to reach down to that love to be able to forgive, to move forward, to grow, and develop. And that word wickedness, the Greek in that word means lawlessness. And I know people jump all over lawlessness, but it actually means not following the law of God. And again, people jump all over that of saying, well, see, we got all the lists, 613 laws. There's the Ten Commandments. There's the other things that churches has added. Um, like I've often told you as a kid, the things that we couldn't, if it was fun, we couldn't do it. Those type of things. But John tells us in John 13, 35, but he says, by this, everyone know you're, you're my disciples if you love one another. So it's easy to see how those lists may be things that, well, what can I do? What can I get away with? And it's not, what is love coming out of your heart? Only the Holy Spirit can bring those changes within us that need to be made. Only the love of God working through us can uh, deal with some of the situations in our life. How are you doing with love? Are you checking your heart actions every day of why are you doing some of the things you're doing or saying the things you're saying. There are about 67 verses in the New Testament about loving one another, so it's an important topic. Because in all of Scripture, there's only six verses they try to pull out against LGBTQ, but there's 67 about loving one another, and I'm not so sure the church is doing too great with that one right now. But then I've got more passages for you. Paul tells us what this love looks like, and you're not going to find a list of do's and don'ts. Maybe a lot of do's. There are some do's here. Romans 12, 9 through 19 says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. That's acts of love. That's why it's not a simple task. But this is what we work on in our own heart and life. And then uh, jump into Galatians 5.13. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. We have freedom in Christ. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Meaning those things are just selfish ambitions. But rather serve one another humbly in love. And the last one for this section I'll look at is... 1 John 4, 7, John the Apostle was very much an apostle about love. And he wrote, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. If you live in love, wickedness will fade away. Those things that are lawless, those things that shouldn't be there because you don't live under the law of God, to love God, self, and others. Jesus changed the world through love. And as simple as it seems, it's something that we can see happen as well. The second thing he told his followers was to do, endure to the end. Will you endure? Will you keep going forward? When we are faithful to something, we can go through a lot of things to see it through. There may be some hassles and conflicts, but we get there. We don't give up. And the word means to persevere, to remain. How is your stick to itiveness? Are you sticking to those things that you know are important? I get to thinking even with our own congregation, we those who were faithful to us for many years, and then they walk away and realize when you ask, well, what happened? What's going on? Well, someone offended me. 
We're human. If you're in church and haven't been offended, stick around. You probably will be. <laughs> it's those things that's just going to happen, but don't let it get in between your relationship with God. As, often, as I often say, don't let, it get, let a hypocrite get between you and God, because if that happens, the hypocrite's still closer to God than you are. You don't want to be worse than a hypocrite. So don't let other people affect your relationship with God. Stick to it. Endure. Questions about faith? We all have them. Doubts about faith? We all have them. But instead of running from them, you seek others who can help encourage you and guide you so that you move forward. We want to move forward with the things of God. In James 1.25 it says, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So yes, by grace we're saved through faith. It's not what we do that gets our relationship with God. It's what Christ has done for us. We get that. But then there's this part now of, well, then what do we do? We endure. We keep doing things in the kingdom of God. And as we fulfill those things that God has called us to do, we will be blessed. There are over 100 verses in the Bible about endurance. It's an important topic. We need to stick with things. In Romans 5, 2 through 5, it says, Through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We don't like having to go through those times we have to endure. But we find through it that it helps us grow and mature. None of us want to sign up for that part. In fact, I think if they probably told us that, sometimes our early beginning walks with Christ, we might have walked away. But we know that it's important for us to mature and grow. And as Jesus even said in Matthew 24, but he had also said in Matthew 10, 22, he says, and you will be hated for all by, for my name's sake, but the ones who endure to the end will be saved. That's a tough saying. None of us want to be hated by others. We, it seems like if you love, you'd be loved, but Jesus loved unconditionally and ended up on a cross. We know from the disciples, they were all persecuted, yet they endured to the end. Ten of them were martyred. John, the beloved, was the only one who wasn't martyred. However, tradition teaches us, church tradition teaches, that he was boiled in oil, lived through it, and then was exiled to an island. I'm not sure if that's worse than death or not, but it could be. But nonetheless, they endured. They knew their message was true. They knew they had hope for the world, and... That sometimes is what carries us on, is that hope for the things of God. And yes, whenever we go into our world with this love of Christ, there may be those against us, but make sure that they're against us because of our love and not just because we're being a jerk. Because we're seeing that by a lot of people too. I'm, we hear a lot about religious persecution and religious freedoms are in danger these days. And I just think, what are they thinking? Why are they hiding behind this whenever... It's obviously wrong what they're trying to do. They're not being martyred. They're not being persecuted. There was a book written, I guess it was probably at the end of last century, called Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it went through history of the, from the apostles on, of some of the big names of people who've worked in Christianity and the way they have been martyred for the kingdom of God. There is no way that things they're facing is martyrdom. And it frustrates me, especially when I hear with school starting that there are Christian schools who have gone to court to, um, because they fired LGBTQ teachers and they're hiding behind the fact, well, it's our religious freedom. But yet, as they've investigated those schools, they have hired people from other faiths to teach math and English and science, just not religion. And they're okay with those, but they're not okay with those who are LGBTQ. That's not religious freedom, that's discrimination. 
We see also that um, the whole thing of, of all these things that are happening, it makes us think, God, why is this your people are acting this way? It's causing so much work for us. We can't hide behind those things of cause of thinking of this is our freedoms that's being abused whenever it may be that we're just imposing on other people's rights. But there may be a time that we're attacked and like, because of what we believe. We could see that in our lifetime. And it may not be because of some of the extreme people who are really giving Christianity a bad name. But when that happens... If that happens, will we persevere? Are we strong enough in our faith to endure no matter what may be thrown at us to know that this message is so important? People need to know about God's love, that it doesn't matter about my personal safety, my personal needs. It's about helping others come into the kingdom of God. Which leads to the third thing Jesus said. The third thing he told the disciples to do while he were waiting is proclaim Jesus' message. We proclaim this message of Christ. The translation I read uses the words, the gospel of the kingdom. What does that even mean? The gospel of the kingdom. The gospel means good news. The kingdom is this message of love that Jesus gave us. We know that we need this message to be presented to our world. And sadly, this message isn't too well received by a lot in our world because of things that have been overstepped in the name of God. There are people who do get push, pushy. They do tend to be a little judgy. It's not good news to be standing out in front of whatever thing you're against with God hates you or that you're doomed for hell. That's not good news. So we realize that that's something we have to reclaim. And again, that's where the evangelical church is right in the point of presenting the message of Christ but they're wrong whenever it comes to judging, condemning, and overstepping boundaries. But there are things that we look at and realize that it's not just about how many people we bring into the kingdom of God. A friend of mine's roommate used to literally put a notch in his Bible, in the cover of his Bible, for every person he brought to Jesus. That's not what it's about. Proclaiming the message is us allowing God to work through us into our world. Jesus is our example. Nowhere in Scripture do we have him condemning those who were in need. Those who he could condemn, he didn't condemn. He loved. The only people he spoke against were the religious who thought they already had it all together. Some of you are old enough to know this one, but he didn't present the poor spiritual laws to people either to get them into the kingdom. What he did is he went around and did good deeds and healed those who were sick. It wasn't about negativity. It wasn't about opposing people or putting on heavy rules and burdens on people's lives. He taught love. That was the beginning of Christianity. And even as we look at the history of our nation, whenever we know that hospitals were beginning, it were, was Christian organizations who started our medical science field. It was the Ivy League schools that were teaching theology. Yes, things have changed, but it was Christians who saw a need and began to try to meet it. That's bringing the message of the kingdom of God. It's allowing people to live as people, but allowing them to have ways to better their lives. And yeah, we see those words in that scripture about testify and witness, and I know those of us who had to grow up doing that, it may terrify us, but it's pretty much just the things that God has done in your life. Be willing to let other people know about it. It doesn't mean get in your face. It doesn't mean Derek called a couple about a few days ago anyway and was checking in, see how we were doing, tell me how he was doing. He's moved to, to the south. And he said he now understands some of my illustrations about evangelicals now that he's living in the heart of that kind of part of the world. Um, but he said that he was even having his dinner and a woman interrupted his dinner to ask him if he knew Jesus. And I would have loved to see her face when he said yes. <laughs> because we think if they don't look like me, act like me, talk like me, they must not be one of me. And so we see this is happening and we realize, what do we do? We are just to allow the Holy Spirit to work within our lives, to help us help others in this world, to become better people. That whole passage in Romans about love being sincere, that whole section are things that we should put into practice. 
As we allow the Holy Spirit to work in each of our lives individually, we will start seeing things happen differently. And I know not all of us are called to preach. Thank God for that or I'd be out of a job. But we all have different roles, different responsibilities. That is how we bring the message. It's not just about teaching and preaching. It's about doing the kingdom of God. And that's why the Holy Spirit gave us all so many different gifts. We're told that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, he says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of services, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but in all of them, in every one, is the same, work, same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Not for self-promotion, not for self-edification. It's about for the common good that we bring this kingdom into our world. Now in that section, he does give us some things, the supernatural power to know, to do, and to speak. So those are things that, that he mentions there. But he also gave us uh, some information in Romans to tell us these things, that as we are going about proclaiming the gospel, what it should look like. And he tells us in Romans 12, 5 through 8, he says, So in, in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, meaning proclaiming and preaching, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And then the next verse ties in with the one I read earlier. Let love be genuine. This is how we proclaim the message. Allow these gifts that God has given to us to work through us. And that's going to bear witness and testimony of what God is doing for us and through us. Those areas of faithful service is what we are called to do. That is proclaiming the message. That is presenting God's love, grace, and acceptance to our world. And it's true that there are many things that lead us to think this could be the last days. But we've been thinking this for 2,000 years. Yes, we're closer now than we were 2,000 years ago, but we have no idea of knowing if this is the day or the hour or not. But until then, we focus on what Jesus has told us to do. Don't allow the wickedness, the lawlessness of this world turn our love cold. Allow God's love to continue to flow through us. And I know we can be jaded and hurt and wounded so many times that we don't want to attempt love anymore. But we don't allow our love to grow cold. And yes, there are some tough times. And some of those tough times do help us to mature and grow in Christ. And sometimes we may have to endure persecution because we stand for Christ. <clears throat> and it may not be the persecution that some are proclaiming that they're facing right now. Those who are wanting to hide behind bigotry, misogyny, racism, xenophobia. That's not true. Re uh, religious freedom violations. But what we do is we stand and endure whenever there are things that come against us that try to pull us away from our faith that try to turn us from our belief and what we know about God and we just pray the Holy Spirit will continue to guide us and direct us so to love and endure is part of what we need so we can proclaim this message of Christ not condescending or imposing on others but doing the ministry of Jesus that went about preaching the good news the good news healing those who are in need and doing good. We may not have that gift of healing, but there are ways that we can bring healing into people's hearts and lives as we allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us and we reach out to one another. And as the old saying goes, that's been attributed to St. Francis of Assisi, wherever you go, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. Is today the day? Probably not, but until Christ returns, we are continuing to do the things God has called us to do. And then we will help others to find this walk with God as well. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We wish you were a little more clear of how this was going to play out when it was going to happen. But God, we know that you will reveal things as they need to be revealed. And God, as we've looked at different things in our world that 
make people start thinking, oh, the end is near, the end is near, and we could easily jump on that as well because we see things that just aren't like they've been before. But God, we know it is all in your timing. And God, whatever that day may be, we don't have to live in fear that we're not going to be good enough or holy enough because our righteousness is in you. And we don't have to live in fear that we haven't told enough people because God, your Holy Spirit directs us where we need to go and you lead us where we need to be. But God, we do know that we need to look at ourselves and not always at others. Maybe we can learn from some things they do that we shouldn't, but in our own life, we can learn to love. God, help us to not allow our love to grow cold. Allow us to continue in this love that you put in our heart. And God, when it does get tough, whenever we start having doubts and fears, when it feels like there are attacks that come our way, help us, oh God, to stay strong in our faith in you, the faith that we may have, even if it's a small faith, knowing that you will continue to help us as we endure and persevere. And God, we do want to be part of your message that goes into the world, and we do want to preach love. We want to preach as you did, O oh God, to bring that, that care and concern for individuals, never in judgment or condemnation, but giving hope and encouragement and strength to those who needed it. And God, we know that you also, Jesus, went around doing good. And God, help us to find those areas in our life that we can do good. Those areas where we may need to see what our gifts and abilities and talents are that help either to proclaim the message or just present the message of love to our world. God, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for what you've done in our life. And God, if this is the day we want to be excited and ready to go, but God, if it is another thousand years, then help us to continue to follow after you with this hope and assurance and with this message of your love, grace, and acceptance. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's see if we got on. We'll take prayer requests. Uh, looks like there's no request online today. Um, are there any requests here that you would like for us to? Yeah, Catherine. Also, I have a dear friend that um, was uh, waiting for a heart transplant, and now um, it looks like he's he's not going to be able to have that. Oh, okay. So just um, strength and peace, and for his sister who's taking care of him. Okay. Um, they have to make a decision this okay. week. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, just for, for my friends. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Let's go to God in prayer. God, we bring you these needs that Catherine has presented this morning, O oh Lord. We ask that you be with her family as they continue um, working with their elderly father and the um, his healing and his recovery, oh God, just be with him and um, the, just the things that he's struggling with in his own personal health and well-being. God, we just commit him, his life into your hands for your will to be done in his life. And God, we just pray for this family as they um, have to be there so much and to offer so much help and just with one another as they continue to, uh, to take on these tasks that are needed. And God, for this friend of hers that's uh, needing a heart transplant and it looks like it's not going to come through, God, we ask for just direction and peace and comfort in that, that family, oh God, for the sister who's helping with the decision. Lord, you know what needs to be done. And again, we just present his life to you, knowing that this life is temporary, but our life with you is eternal. God, we pray that you minister to those around him, that you bring him the peace and comfort and assurance he needs, that you bring him that uh, your Holy Spirit's presence just to dwell in his heart and in his life. God, we just pray for each one here that may have requests or needs in their heart that they didn't want to present, but God, you know what those things are that we all struggle with, and whether it's financial or relational or uh, physical or mental, Whatever it is, oh God, we just want to lay it before you and ask for your continued help and strength and that your Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us in every step of the way. And God, we do continue to pray for our world and those around us. And when we see some of the chaos around us, we feel so powerless. But God, you have given us power through the Holy Spirit. And God, I just ask that you encourage each one of us to continue to step out in love to continue to endure and continue to be the person you called us to be in service to your kingdom and for the kingdom of God that needs to be active and working in this world. 
We thank you, O oh God, for all that you've done, and we ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So at this time, Sherry's going to do announcements. Good morning, Christ Chapel. Good morning, Good morning. If this is your first time here or if you've joined us online, we're very happy that you chose today to spend the day with us. And if it is your first time here, we hope that you found a new home. If you could, there is a welcome card in the seat pocket in front of you, if you could fill that out. Also, we use this if you've changed your, any of your information so that we can find out where you are. So we can keep an eye on you. Not really. The other one is the ministry response card, and if you have any questions, praise reports, testimonies, need a call, desire to serve, especially the desire to serve, board, staff, any of that, you can fill that out and put that in that little black box right there. The retreat is almost here, so September 11 is the last day that you can pay and sign up because rooms are going fast. If you have a double occupancy, it's 280. Uh, single is 370. I think we're pretty close to being out of single rooms, right? We're pretty, cl we're pretty close, so I'm going to need to know in the next week for that one, okay? So if you need to know if you have a balance and you don't know what it is, come see me because I can tell you. Pay up. <laughs> and welcome. Oh, the day rate. Oh, that's right. Oh, good help is so hard to find. The day rate's 100 bucks. You can see me about that, too. Also, a couple things. I have uh, paperwork that I need you to fill out if you've signed up. The other thing, too, is I also have a packet that will kind of give you an overview of the weekend. Friday night, you will not get dinner. So make sure that you eat dinner before you go up there, okay? And then we have our first, like, little orientation section at 8 o'clock that night, 7 o'clock. Okay, 6.30 for group leaders. If you don't know you're a group leader, you will. You were voluntold. And uh, seven for the rest of us. So eat before you get up there so you can get checked into your room. Tithe is offering? No. Bible study is on hiatus. Now tithe is an offering. Thank you for being a generous group of people that have allowed us to have, first of all, our own building and everything else, and we're just grateful for that. So let's go ahead and pray over the offering. You can do PayPal, uh, auto pay. You can do it by check, which you can put in the box back there. Or you can do the magic cure-all cord, however that works. Gracious Lord, thank you so much for everything that you provide for us. And we just ask you to watch over and protect it. Give us wisdom on how your money is to be spent and distributed so that it is pleasing to you. And we ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. Music team, rock it. Place, just real quick, uh, we are getting the YMCA parking back again, so we'll have that starting next Sunday. So if you'd like to park in that lot, we've got the code to get back in there. So we've got extra parking available to you.
accomplish the fire in your presence as we sing to you. No word comes alive in your presence as we trust.